So we know that addressing the climate crisis is absolutely critical. And as we've heard, the land implications are absolutely enormous. Dealing with these implications and moving to net zero or negative emissions in a rights responsible way is what I believe to be one of the biggest or maybe the biggest challenge of our time. But we must rise up to this challenge. As some, several of our speakers said, our lives depend on it. Uh, and this panel is an opportunity for us to take a step back and to think about the big picture but also in particular to think about some of the solutions and next steps. I've been thrilled that there have been um, a lot of discussions about solutions throughout today. Um, and then this is one more opportunity uh, for us to hear both from our wonderful and diverse panel of experts uh, to help us reflect on this, uh, this question of what do we do next? Um, how do we roll up our sleeves and work together collectively? Um, and then also this will be, the session will be an opportunity for all of us to speak uh, together. I'm hoping to make this as interactive as possible for, for this type of conference. Um, so joining me right now we have, oh, and I'm sorry, I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Caitlin Cordes from the Columbia Center on Sustainable Investment. Um, and I am joined by three wonderful, amazing people that I'm so thrilled to be sitting up here with. Um, right Immediately right next to me we have Cynthia Rosenzweig who is a senior research scientist, the head of the Climate Impacts Group at NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies, also the co-chair of the New York City Panel on Climate Change, and one of the co-authors of the uh, IPCC's report on climate and land that she is literally working on as soon as today with the deadline tonight. So we are so grateful that she managed to get here, um, and we will let her go as soon as this panel is over so she can rush back and get that deadline finished. Um, Next to her, we have Cesar Rodriguez Garavito, who is at New York University School of Law and also the former executive, executive director of De Justicia in Colombia, which is an amazing uh, human rights organization. And then um, we also have Janine Yazzie, the co-founder of Sixth World Solutions, LLP, uh, the Sustainable Development Program Coordinator of the International Indian Treaty Council and co-convener co of the Indigenous Peoples Major Group for Sustainable Development. So thank you, all, of, all three of you, for joining. Um, I'll start with Cesar, uh, because we just on this last panel, we're talking a little bit about some of the legal issues um, uh, that, that are relevant from a climate change perspective. Uh, and you are, you've been involved with some really groundbreaking climate change litigation in Latin America. And you've seen firsthand the opportunities, but also the challenges or limitations that climate litigation holds. Um, given your experience, what actions would you suggest that we take now uh, to address the challenges arising at the nexus of land, climate, and human rights? And please speak into a microphone. I think there's one next. Hello. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for the invitation. It's an honor to be here. I feel intimidated by the importance of the task that Cynthia is working on and I actually have nothing else to do today so uh, after this panel I'm, I'm basically free uh, so but I, I have been pretty busy though for the last uh, few years uh, working at the intersection of indigenous people's rights um, land uh, issues and climate change mostly in the Amazon region uh, but now at NYU really looking at other uh, regions and countries of the world like India, um, uh, some countries in Europe. And as I expand the type of work that I've been doing with uh, uh, friends and colleagues from Latin America and elsewhere, I am encouraged by the growing awareness of the need for integration, uh, integration of the fields, of fields and approaches that would otherwise uh, be on separate tracks, specifically indigenous people's rights issues, climate change um, uh, and climate governance issues, and the more generic field of human rights. And more recently, and very encouragingly, um, interactions and productive conversations with scientists. So I will refer to two specific instances that to my mind uh, condense these intersections, um, and if there's time or interest in the q and I'll be happy to elaborate more analytically about how we could take those uh, intersections forward. Um, so as I was asked to comment on the lawsuit that we led at the Justicia um, at Bogota, Colombia, uh, which basically was or sued the Colombian, we sued the Colombian government 
on behalf of 25 young people between the ages of 7 and 25 um, on constitutional grounds, meaning alleging and proving that the Colombian government were violating a series of basic fundamental human rights of young people, right to health, right to life, right to uh, housing, right to, um, um, right to a clean environment, because of its inaction with regards to deforestation in the Amazon region. So this, our case, if you're familiar, you've heard about a well-known case in Europe that was kind of a pioneer in this uh, wave of climate change litigation that people like Mike Berger and the uh, Saving Center have been studying systematically for a number of years now. The Urgenda case in, in the Netherlands uh, got the Dutch government to increase its commitment in terms of the carbon emissions reduction um, relative to what they had promised in 20, 2015 in Paris. Our litigation was more modest in terms of the goal. We, all we wanted, uh, this is ambitious enough uh, for reasons that I'll explain in a moment, um, was the Colombian government to come through to deliver on its own promise. So they had, the uh, president uh, of the time had promised uh, with uh, uh, funding from Norway, uh, uh, the UK, and Germany that by 2020, uh, deforestation would be brought down to net zero by 2020 in the Amazon region. So the government was not on track to deliver on that target, and we sued. Uh, and the reason why we sued on behalf of 25 young people, as opposed to the more conventional legal approach, would have been to sue on behalf of uh, Amazonian indigenous communities located right there on the spot of uh, the hot spot of deforestation, is because we wanted to push the boundary in, in terms of what the law understands by causality, right? So this is, and this is where we started to take a page and many pages from climate science. Uh, we said, of course, this is the, the, the impact of climate change is not, or the or, or whatever happens with the fires in the Amazon region, and this my second example, my second um, uh, illustration, comes from the Brazilian Amazon, where I also did field work, and now I'm involved in some uh, legal actions. Uh, we know from climate science that uh, the reverberations, the impact of the lack of action on deforestation in the Amazon um, is felt around the globe. But we want, didn't want to go as far as to sue on behalf of someone in, in Fiji or, the, or B the Bahamas, but we did want to sue on behalf of young people located around Colombia, which was kind of ambitious enough in terms of legal doctrine. And, and second, we wanted the court to explicitly assert and protect the rights of future generations. Right? And this is also something that the law has had a hard time with. International human rights law, the constitutional law, it says if you read the Universal Declaration, it's a fantastic um, assertion of uh, human dignity, but it all stops at the level of living generations. Right? So nothing precludes from a, uh, from a literal point of view of the reading of the Declaration and then the Bill of Rights in international uh, human rights law. Uh, not to, nothing prevents one generation from living an uninhabitable planet to the next generation, right? So this is what we also claimed in the lawsuit. So make a long story short, it took us one year to look at the different approaches that people uh, had um, uh, attempted in different parts of the world. And maybe this is a, a first generalizable lesson, at least in the, the professional, my professional circles that I'm more familiar with, meaning human rights scholarship and, and, and lawyering. There's incredible fragmentation of efforts, right? So each organization tries to do its own thing. We compete for funding. We uh, duplicate the wheel. We, we reinvent the wheel. And we, we, pu we put out 100 reports on, the sing on a single issue as opposed to doing what the jour journalists, for example, have learned to do with initiatives like the Panama Papers. Collaborate, 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 and come out with a bank. So that's one, one idea. If we could be, as a field, more strategic, and this is what I'm trying to do partly now um, in, in, with colleagues in different parts of the world and also here at NYU, if, if we could look more systematically, if we could have a systems view of litigation and the use of human rights law and instruments so as to hopefully be more collaborative and more strategic about where and which, uh, where we pick our fights and where, uh, where and, 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 and which fights. So that's 
one lesson. And finally, so the, the, the story has so far a happy ending in that we litigated this case all the way to the, uh, the Supreme Court of Colombia. We won, and not only did the court um, grant all our petitions, but it also threw in a, a really interesting idea um, uh, by recognizing the Amazon region as a subject of rights. So we're in the process of working on the implementation. Uh, next uh, month, there's a series of hearings, public hearings, uh, uh, in which the Colombian government will have to be accountable before the Colombian press and the public and the public opinion on what's done, what, has, what, what it's done and hasn't done uh, to comply with the court's orders. Um, so that's, uh, deforestation came down for the first time in several years this year. That, of course, cannot be attributed to the ruling or to the litigation, but certainly at least a minor role has been played by this effort in terms of making this issue quite salient and visible. Um, and uh, so, and I'll end with a shorter story about uh, Brazil, um, which shows what a non-integrated approach um, leads to, uh, to climate change, land, and, and indigenous people's rights. So in 2012, I was lucky enough to visit uh, the state of Pará in the uh, Brazilian Amazon, capital city, Belém, um, where maybe some of you have heard about the Belo Monte Dam, third largest dam in the world, uh, very contentious, uh, contentious. And, uh, and that was a clear case. For any practical purpose, that was kind of a textbook case of violation of the rights of indigenous people to be consulted before any uh, large infrastructure project goes forward in their territories. Also, it's protected by the, uh, that right is protected ex explicitly by the Brazilian constitution. Uh, the, go the Brazilian government decided to bulldoze over that, uh, the, 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 the protests and, and the opposition of, of not just indigenous peoples, but uh, social movements in the Amazon region. Project goes forward. Um, project, uh, the dam gets completed uh, first stage in 2016. Now it's about to be completed. And now the warnings of both scientists uh, from 2012 and activists at the same time who said that if projects like Belo Monte went ahead mindlessly, the Amazon could reach a tipping point and turn into basically a dry savanna. And that, that would make Belo Monte or large infrastructure projects like Belo Monte useless because there would be no rain, right? For, for, the, for the dam to operate and produce electricity. This year, I feel, and I don't think the, the activists and the lawyers in that case feel any validation for this because it's a very sad story. Now, it, this year, one of the um, peer-reviewed reports or uh, journal um, uh, articles that came out on the Brazilian Amazon and deforestation shows that the Belo Monte Dam will be able to produce only 60% of the electricity that it was built to produce because of the radical uh, disturbance of the uh, of the of the water cycle, right? Uh, so there is no there are no trees. Humidity doesn't get recycled. There's less rain, and as a result, there's not not, not enough water to uh, produce uh, electricity. So talk about the impact of teasing apart of separating uh, variables that should be integrated, and and if the a Brazilian government and the um, the companies that invested in the in the um, in the dam had paid attention to voices that um, demanded a more holistic, ecologically sound view of the uh, 360 repercussions of that uh, particular project. We would be in a different place. Thank you so much, uh, Cynthia. I'll turn to you now. Uh, you know, as I said, you're a leading climate scientist. You've worked and you are working on the climate and land uh, report right now. So uh, could you please share with us some of the uh, findings from that report and some of the recommendations for, for solutions and next steps as well? Is this on? Um, thank you, Caitlin. Thank you for inviting, um, inv inviting me to come and be part of this important day, uh, all day long meeting. Sorry I wasn't able to be here for all of it. 
Um, I want to share some of the key aspects of the special report on climate change and land uh, that the IPCC um, uh, released in August. The special report, yeah, a different special report came out yesterday on oceans and cryosphere. And earlier there had been a special report on the 1.5 degrees C um, achievement of um, uh, what it would take to do that and what would be the impacts of that. I'm going to focus on, and the acronym is CIRCLE, Special Report on Climate Change and Land. It, I think that there was a, a positive response to the report because people have a special affinity to land. So even though it's only 30% of the planetary surface area and the ocean is 70%, this is our home. And part of the response to the report, I think, was that it was actually, it was more personal. A lot of climate change is really actually hard to get your arms around, you know, like we're always, you know, the scientists are always saying, well, in 2100, this is what's going to happen. And, you know, everybody's eyes are glazing over. I've seen it happen so many times. So um, this report on land focused on desertification. It focused, it had three major core areas, uh, desertification, land degradation, and food security. And there are really, I think, important chapters and findings and, most importantly, responses uh, around all of those aspects. I'm going to share with you more today um, what was going on in the report in regard to food security, because that's the, um, uh, the part that I worked on. And in the back is Eric Menkos uh, from Mexico, who uh, was, is also an, um, a lead author on the report. First, and this echoes a little bit what Cesar was just saying about new configurations. The previously, IPCC basically would only look at agriculture production. And a lot of the, actually, the greenhouse gas inventories that the nation states also do look at is, here's agricultural production. Really, for the first time in a very concerted way, the IPCC expanded the approach to food to a food system approach, which includes not only the production side, but all the supply chain activity, by the way, also all of the pre-production energy use, you know, creating the fertilizer, uh, manufacturing the fertilizer, for example, the machinery, et cetera, et cetera, all of that, the fertilizer alone is very, very uh, greenhouse gas intensive. Then the supply chain part, and then all the way to the people eating the food. So for the first time, it wasn't just about crop production and impacts on crops and the but it really, and livestock, of course, are very, very important, which I'll get to. But it really then looked at the, created a new configuration. And that's, by the way, I think, from being at many events, and I'm sure many of you all were at, at many events this week, and I think what's emerging is really new configurations that are actually what are needed to go forward for climate change solutions, similar to what you were saying about bringing together those groups. The other focus was on food security. So we, uh, we used a food security lens, and that also brings the people into it. So again, there's availability. That's, of course, that's the production side. But then there's the access side with all the socioeconomics, the ability and access to, to, um, to uh, obtain food. There's the nutrition side and utilization. And then there's the stability part very, very strong links to climate because of increases in extreme events that are already happening and that are projected to get worse. So when you, when you look at this new configuration, the role of the food system is absolutely bigger than we had really realized before. So one of the main findings of the report is that when you take all of these activities, the food, the food system as a whole is responsible for 21 to 37 percent of total greenhouse gas emissions. This is absolutely enormous. And this is linked directly to land-based activities. 
Now, the, on the other way back, that's the impacts of the food system on the climate system. But we all know that the climate system has very, very severe and important impacts of, of climate onto the food system. So this is impacts that are already happening in terms of things like the, even in 2019, the heat waves in Europe with um, associated yield declines. Um, the, in 2010, 2011, the, the uh, heat waves uh, and drought in uh, Eastern Europe and Russia uh, with an associated price spike having an effect directly on uh, availability and access. Uh, floods uh, again in 2010 in Pakistan that, de that decimated the, 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 the food stocks. So the impacts of not only the food system on climate, but the impacts of the climate system on food are just this very enormous part of what's going on around the world because every country basically has, an, has, has some kind of food system of their own and many, many different ones. So turning to the solutions, and this is what I think also what distinguishes this report, which is that there were many, many dozens of solutions that were brought forward. So it was actually, I think, also why there was a positive response to it was because it wasn't all gloom and doom. It's that there are many, many, many things that can be done across this entire food system uh, with the land. But there is a big but. And that has to do with, in regard to land, the competition between food security and climate change mitigation in regard to bioenergy and carbon capture and storage. These are two very major land uses that if not done carefully, and this is one of the, this is one of the major findings of the report, if not done carefully, they can be in competition. That mitigating climate change, if we're planting uh, bioenergy crops, uh, first generation, second generation, all of that uh, in massive amounts in unsustainable ways, it, this can directly affect and compete with food security. But also what the report says is that if it's done well, the two can actually integrate and combine. But, but it's a real challenge to ramp up we're talking about at the high, several million, up to nine million hectares of land. And this is at the high end. We were, Eric and I were just looking at this on the way here because uh, we kept, you know, we wanted to give an example of how, well, how big is several million or up to nine million, right? That's the area of Australia basically. So this is a lot of land that can be coming into competition and I think very germane to our discussion here today. It has, so when we do this, when we undertake bioenergy, which land absolutely has to play a role in climate change mitigation, we cannot let, because remember, 30%, one third of emissions are coming from, uh, from. So two things to finish up. We really discussed it. When, it's wonderful to work in the, IP, with, in the IPCC because people, the co-authors, are from all different food environments, food, uh, all different countries, all different uh, disciplines around the food system. And so we had some folks in the chapter going, yes, we must, uh, you, so the role, the role of diets is, was very, probably you, heard, you read more about the role of diets in the response. So. Uh, by having more plant-based di based diets and having, if uh, there is livestock, if there are meat-based, meat source, animal source products, those need to be raised in very, very careful low greenhouse gas uh, settings. Um, and that this change in the diets can then actually, in the food system approach, get back and change the land, you see? That's why it's so important. But there are people on the land, and there are people raising the, uh, those, those food, that food. And so in the chapter and in the movement, I'm sure that you are aware of, 
there is the just transition um, approach. And the, so we had some people say, yes, everybody change their diets, right? And so, yes, that's great. But then we had other people saying, really representing smallholder farmers everywhere, and which are often mixed systems with plants and with crops and livestock. And they were going, you can't just say that so blithely. We have to work on just transitions. And that's a very, very important part of the chapter. Um, just in terms of other just personal solutions um, for Western-based, and I would say, uh, you know, high income, food loss and waste, there's lots we can do, right? And I'm just going to end on one more thing about the climate and the food system, which is we have to watch out for food instability due to extreme, increasing extreme events. For a long time, you know, we always think about this sort of gradual change of climate, but really it's that. It's a combination of those gradual changes of higher temperatures, changes in the hydrological cycle, but it is also increases in extreme events, more heat waves, more extreme precipitation for coastal areas, greater coastal flooding, and many, uh, and m many, if not most, I would say, basically all land-based food production and food system, all the food supply chain part, and also the markets where people are buying their food will be affected by food instability, by the climate instability as well. We can't forget that. So that's, that is 120 pages. We know exactly because we're working on the proofs right now. That's 120 pages in about 10 minutes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I think you just saved us some time for having, <laughs> we now don't have to read all 120 pages. <laughs> yeah. No, please do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. And uh, I will now turn it over to Janine. Janine, you've been doing really amazing work in so many different spaces, um, working with and advocating on behalf of uh, indigenous peoples. Um, and, you know, we're here to talk about uh, the big picture, but also solutions and next steps. And, and so I'm curious, you know, what are you advocating for and uh, in terms of solutions to uh, this climate, land, human rights nexus? Um, and then also, I know that you've been involved from the start with the Right Energy Partnership, and I was hoping you could tell us about that as well. Uh, thank you. Um, it always shocks me sometimes when I'm on a panel with experts, right? I'm like, all the places being born indigenous and Native American in the US can take you um, just by surviving and learning the tools of survival and the tools of resistance and resilience. Um, we have a joke in our communities that to be indigenous and to be successful in this world, you have to be a lawyer, you have to be a healer, you have to be a policy analyst, and you have to be a visionary and a philosopher. If you're weak in any one of those, you won't get very far. And it's a burden that so many people have to carry that simultaneously um, emphasizes how the role of marginalized communities and in now this era of climate change, the communities most impacted by climate change are not only tasked with the responsibility of proving their vulnerabilities and proving the, the systemic injustices that have put them in this place, but they're also tasked with building the solutions that are necessary to help everyone out of it. And it's been quite a two weeks, um, I've been here for such a long time, <laughs> I want to go home. It's been quite a depressing two weeks um, because with the UN Climate Action Summit and with uh, the UN SDG Summit and all of the high-level talks and coalition meetings, I've, I've been so saddened by how much money and resources and studies and time precious, precious time could have been saved had the most vulnerable, had our indigenous peoples been invited to the decision-making tables to discuss these issues and this crisis that we're in from the beginning. I, I feel honored to be here and recognized as an expert, but I'm nowhere near the level of understanding as my elders that have never been invited to these spaces, whose... Um, whose lives continue to be compromised 
and lost and who have been for generations repeating these messages that we have to work together, that we have to move beyond these silos of these institutions and these legal frameworks to actually develop the viable solutions that are necessary. I'm sick right now, and I'm, more, I'm way more cryy when I'm sick, so. <laughs> um, but I'm also just disappointed. I'm disappointed because we're in deep shit. And I spent two and a half weeks away from my family and my communities who are right now dealing with a sudden change in temperatures in the middle of harvest season. So they're losing a lot of crops. Dealing with community members and loved ones and mentors that are so precious to me and are our last bearers of traditional knowledge who are dying from cancers. And I am so fed up with the way these spaces are created and the way these conversations are being carried out because we're missing the point. So I want to share with you a few reasons why I'm going to present this solution to you and why Indigenous peoples are so dedicated to ensuring that in all of our discussions, not only are we integrating the voices of the most marginalized groups, um, but we're constantly fighting for using a rights-based framework in all of our work and building resistance together. I come from the Navajo Nation, and the Navajo Nation has dealt with so many different issues, and I'm... They've recently engaged in a purchase of three coal mines in Wyoming as we're shutting down two coal mines that have created terrible legacies in our, in our homelands, and I want to be upset with them. I want to be um, mad at my nation. And I, but I've also been really upset by sort of the liberal pushback from environmentalism, environmentalists and conservationists who are like, how could they? How could they do this without bringing into their solutions and their frameworks the type of analysis that we need, and that's an analysis that's rooted in anti-colonialism and in anti-capitalism, an analysis that, is, analysis that is rooted in the true history of the United States and how our institutions have been built up, and how these dependencies on extractive economies were forced upon indigenous and marginalized and rural communities, and we've been no, given no other choice. The Black Mesa community, which is on top of our largest purest aquifer, aquifer in the Navajo Nation, with our big, largest source of drinking water, of, of potable water in general, um, was also the site of the most recent forced uh, removal of indigenous peoples in the United States history. In the 1970s, there was a Navajo-Hopi land conflict, right? It wasn't between the Navajo and Hopis, it was between Peabody and the indigenous peoples who originally leave, lived there, but that's how it's framed in law. This removal has embedded uh, a lar long history of historical trauma in our community so that as we're now listening to the climate debates about migration and what we do on our borders, we're, we're feeling this in a different way because we're witnessing what it means, we know what it means when people are forced to leave their homelands and to jump from the frying pot into the fire, so to say, because these migrations aren't, aren't happening to like from the so-called developing nations into developed nations. They're happening from poor, marginalized, colonized communities into other poor, marginalized, colonized communities. And when they're not, when they're happening from rural areas into the urban areas, the culture shock, the lack of ability to deal with the economic consequences of that, of then being thrust into these um, fast-paced uh, economic structures and systems, is going to create another crisis of, or exacerbate our existing crises of inequality, economic inequality in our communities. I also come from communities that were impacted by the largest uranium mill tailing spill in 1979, coming from the Church Rock operations. And so as a result of that, and all of the other forms of extractive economies that are coming around here, we don't have the luxury to talk about climate change adaptation and mitigation with also, without also addressing the legacy of settler colonialism and extractive industries in our homelands because these feedback loops are, are compounding the issues that we're dealing with. So not only is our water already contaminated, not only is our soil already contaminated, but with the desertification that is gripping the Southwest United States right now, this is increasing 
increasing exposure and this is increasing water insecurity and this is collapsing our existing food systems? And the answer is not large scale agriculture. The answer is not uh, just transitioning to solar power and to wind power. The answer is in dismantling settler colonialism and doing that in every field that we're in. And we're running out of time. We've been running out of time. When I say dismantling settler colonialism is necessary, I say that because, and even in our solutions, and even in these, these places where we're supposed to be coming together and building the pathway forward for our global community, we are dealing with the virus of white supremacy, heteropatriarchy, and mechanisms of power that are rooted in these viruses. You know, when, every time you get a virus on your computer or in your body, the only way to address it is to first name it, to first identify it. And for us with our experiences with cancers and the pervasiveness that that can, that can um, in which that can invade your body, chemotherapy takes both the good as well as the bad. And if you're lucky to survive, you'll be left with just a piece of yourself. But it's necessary. It's necessary to eradicate the virus. With the work that we've been doing on, on all of this, it's literally just rooted in this plea to have the right to reclaim our humanity and to reclaim our responsibility to each other and to our natural world. So the Indigenous Peoples Major Group for Sustainable Development, being in all these places, constantly fighting for space, constantly fighting for representation of our most marginalized, our most vulnerable, and constantly begging to be listened to because we have been developing the solutions for quite some time. But those solutions are made impossible due to the existing legal frameworks because our legal frameworks aren't built on justice, they're built on power. Our legal frameworks were built to literally justify the theft of lands, territories, and resources of indigenous peoples and to hold on to the ownership of those lands, territories, and resources. And to our education systems were built to erase the reality of that history and to promote only assimilation into those institutions and into those structures. And we're seeing the result of all of that in our military industrial complex, in our prison industrial complex. And until we address these issues as a whole, that's what we mean by systems change. And that's what we need for our solutions going forward. So we, we had no choice but to develop the right energy partnership as a means to begin to use this language that's being used to create these protocols and these practices that are necessary to deal with the frontline communities in a just manner. Not consulting them, not, not using allegories of their sad stories only to push more neoliberal policies but to actually bring them in into the development of the solutions. And one of our projects is, is slated to begin in Indonesia. And an example of the beauty that people bring to these projects is that it's a hydroelectric project. And it was built and, and structured from conception, looking at both the production of the materials that would be needed all the way to the waste cycle, looking at the community governance system that is needed to inform um, just gender, gender uh, balanced, uh, inclusive community decision making. And they, they took a trash, aluminum, cans, waste, to turn those into micro, micro uh, propellers to create energy that is enough to sustain the community and to share this information. Because knowledge sharing is one of the big platforms of the Right Energy Partnership, to share this information for other communities that can deal with it. So you're, not, you're taking waste out of the ground. You're producing a solution that's going to provide energy in a just manner to all of your community. You're building um, community uh, empowerment and cohesion. You're utilizing and integrating traditional ecological knowledges and practices because to take care, to make sure this project works, you have to take care of the river. You have to take care of the ecosystem around it. You have have to take care of the, all of the forms of life that are dependent on that river, which is why they used micro microstructures in order to do this, not dams, not large propellers, not producing energy to sell back to the market in the main grid, because those processes and models did not serve us before, and our children deserve a better way. And so I, um, I know I'm speaking to a room of, of largely, mostly lawyers. <laughs> 
<laughs> um, I, and also researchers and academics, and all of my plea to you is to please partner with us, listen with us, learn with us. We don't have all of the solutions, but we have been fighting to maintain a pathway and a way to develop those solutions together that can address this true history, that can integrate healing into the partnership development and into our interactions and relationships with our communities, because that's a huge component, component for all of us, right? We all need to heal. We all come from some form of trauma that we've inherited or that we've experienced throughout our lives, especially our women. And we need to integrate this into our solutions or else we're going to continue to come back here in 10 years disappointed in our countries about the lack of commitment and having side events where we're talking about the real solutions. Let's flip that around. And let's take these spaces, let's take these partnerships and this energy to invest in the real solutions and uphold the rights of indigenous peoples because those rights are human rights. But they're rights that are rooted in the respect for all life. Thank you. Thank you so much, Janine. Um, I thought I was going to be the only one crying today, but... <laughs> It's a long week. Um, and I am so delighted that Professor Gerald Torres is here with us today. He's a professor of law at Cornell Law School, um, a leading uh, thinker on environmental law and critical race theory uh, with experience working uh, in government as well, um, and, and also has done some amazing writing, among other things, on settler colonialism and how that's been uh, the, the kind of the relevance for legal strategies, uh, thinking about climate change, et cetera. Uh, so I will turn it over to you. Uh, in the interest of time, I think we have about 10 minutes, and then we'll move into the questions and answers. Well, I, I apologize, first of all, for being late. I was, uh, I perhaps misjudged the, uh, the congestion. Uh, uh, and I was also driving in from Ithaca, so I, 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 I left the countryside, and it got increasingly dense uh, until uh, finally it was, uh, I jumped out of my car and ran here, basically. Uh, uh, <laughs> almost, not quite. Uh, so uh, I'll, 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 I'll be brief, because I want to I talk about a, a couple of things, and I want to tie two things uh, together that, that uh, may not be... Uh, conceived of as a as a as uh, coming from the same place, right? So I'm going to talk about about the about treaty litigation that's been ongoing, especially tr resource-based treaty litigation on the one hand, and then I want to talk about our children's trust and the the lawsuit that the children have filed. Um, it, it's ongoing now in in, in Oregon, and, and, and I want to tie them together to show you how, in fact, they're really about about the same thing in many ways. Um, so uh, one of the, I'm not gonna recite the whole history of treaty making in, in, in the United States, but, but many of the treaties that, that uh, Native people entered into carried with them uh, guarantees that the tribal members would have access to both on uh, tribal land and off tribal land resources. Uh, the claim to off-tribal land resources has been perhaps the most uh, um, contested. And so you can take a, a set of cases uh, like the, Wash the Stevens Treaty cases out of uh, Washington State that have been litigated almost from the beginning, almost from the time Washington State came I into the Union. But two years ago now, uh, there was a very important uh, uh, decision in which the tribes were asking the state to repair the culverts under the roads because it interrupted the, the capacity of salmon to migrate uh, upstream. And thus, uh, if they couldn't migrate upstream, the, the stock of salmon, which the tribe had a treaty claim to, would be dissipated. Uh, the, by an equally divided Supreme Court, it was during that moment when there were only eight members of the Supreme Court, uh, the lower court opinion was upheld. And what the lower court opinion held w was, first of all, the, the practical thing, that the state had to begin to remove these culverts or uh, um, 
repair them in order to increase the the uh, the uh, capacity of fish to travel upstream. Okay, it seems like a very it's a in fact very concrete, right? But but the important part of the decision is this. The important part of the decision is that is that the treaty, of course, guaranteed not just the right to fish, that is, the, the right to have a chance to try to catch a fish, that also guaranteed the right for fish to be there. That, that it actually had to be something that you could, could catch. And so that meant that the two things are true. One is any fish that were stocked by the state became part of the, the, the uh, resource that was available to the tribes, one. Two, that the tribes had the right and ability to intervene on state decisions that would have an impact on the resource. So that meant, this means road building, it means uh, timbering decisions, it means decisions that aren't at least on their face connected to fish, but have a, a, an impact on that resource. While this was going on, the uh, solicitor in the Department of the Interior issued an opinion letter that essentially said that the tribes in Maine have a, a, an environmental right to intervene in state and federal uh, uh, procedures that uh, have a, can or may have a deleterious impact on the resource that's guaranteed to the tribes through treaties. The state of, of, of Oregon uh, uh, at first uh, uh, you know, vociferously opposed this construction, right? And in fact, uh, were called on the carpet by Justice Sotomayor uh, for a claim they made in the argument below where they said, basically they said, the state has the, the right and the power to eliminate all fish in the streams and there would be no injury to the tribe that would be cognizable under the, under the treaties. And uh, Justice Sotomayor, of course, wasn't having any of it. Uh, and so she, uh, if you've ever seen anybody actually eat words, right, this was about as close as it came. Uh, he wasn't actually ripping up parts of his transcript and, and <laughs> eating himself, but, but just about. But what emerges, of course, from this is that the, the resource interests that the tribes have carry with them an environmental Right. right, a right to protect the, the uh, habitat and to influence decisions that affect the habitat and are tied to, in my view, the enforcement of the trust duty that the federal government has and that it undertook in relationship to the tribes for the maintenance of that resource. So it's, a, it's an opening into the, the, the question of, uh, in my view, it's, it's important just for the tribes, but it's even more important because it asks a, a really fundamental question and it asks the question that the children in our children's trust are asking. And that is, what is government for? At root, that's the question. It's not what is the government doing Right? It's a question about the fundamental legitimacy of government actions. And the idea is that if the government isn't acting to protect our interest in things that we can't do for ourselves or to protect those resources that are incapable of public in the sense of state ownership or private in the sense of just private property ownership, but are public in a broader way like the atmosphere, for example. That if they are not acting in our interest in the protection of those resources, they are acting contrary to the reasons that all of us would have gotten together to create a government in the first place. So that the, envir the environmental claims that the tribes are making and the environmental claims that the children are making in Oregon ask a fundamental question right, about the legitimacy of government action. And it, one thing that we need to do going forward, it seems to be, is to interrogate every decision according to that metric. According to that metric. That is, government exists to do those things which we can't do for ourselves. Right? 
And if it is not acting in our interest as it does those things, then why is it doing it? It's a fundamental question of legitimacy. So when you think about climate change, and one, the, the stuff I'm working on now is actually about social movements and the way social movements actually can produce durable legal change. And uh, climate change is, of course, perhaps the most uh, 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 visible emerging social movement currently. Right? But it, at root, it's asking that question. Right? Years ago, I, I, I wrote a, 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 an essay called Who Owns the Sky? Right? Uh, because what I wanted people to focus on is that there are those resources that, in fact, belong in common. Not uh, in, in common to all of us, and for which the state has an obligation to speak to us about how it maintains those resources. Obviously, the the biggest challenge, right, is the is, is uh, <laughs> the earth is on fire, right? It, 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 it is how the government is going to act consistent with continued life, right? And that seems to me the biggest and most profound question we can ask. It will, have, it will have expressions from the various communities. It involves economic systems. It involves in which resources are distributed so that people can actually live. But it asks the, a, a fundamental question, which is if the, if the states, if states don't exist to preserve the capacity of people themselves to live, then is the state legitimate? That was wonderful. Thank you so much. It was a very succinct uh, but very powerful question, uh, presentation, but question that you've left us with as well. Um, I promised some interaction, and we have about 15 minutes left, so let's take one round of a few questions, and then we will uh, see how much time we have left for potentially a second round as well. Um, as my colleague reminded people earlier, a question uh, has a question mark at the end usually. Uh, we want this to be interactive, but we also want to make sure that we stay on topic as well. So um, please raise your hands. Yes, I see one right here to start. And please use the microphone as well. Hello, is that on? My name is Daphne Dixon. I'm with an organization called Live Green. And what an amazing day. And um, this panel is great. I've been waiting all day for actually hearing about actions that people are taking and, and, um, and real work. And uh, not that the other work's not real, but you, you know, just I have a question. Um, I really was inspired by what you said. And I'm just wondering if, if there was like two or three real collaborations that you could make like today, like by snapping your fingers, that you feel would move all of this forward, what would they be? That's my question. Great. Thank you. We had other hands. Yes, I have uh, one in the back and then two up here. Um, I don't have a question. I just wanted to say thank you for, for a moving and inspiring panel. I know I did want to say that I, I once have an excuse for looking at social media. There were 500,000 people on the street in Montreal led by, by, by children. And, and, and the issue of the interlinkage between climate rights and indigenous rights was a major, and the legitimacy of the government. I'm a, a civil servant, so I won't speak to that, but the, everything that you spoke to was, was out on, on the street. So I'm, I'm, I just wanted to share it with you. But most of all, thank you for the panel. Great, thank you. Um, and then we had, we had two here. So uh, Jan Dash with the World Scientific uh, Climate Change Encyclopedia, the editor. Uh, so I have a question for Cynthia Rosenzweig at, uh, about the IPCC land uh, report, and it concerns plant-based meat substitutes. So earlier in the week, uh, Jeffrey Sachs interviewed uh, Pat Brown from uh, one of the firms that's trying to uh, uh, produce uh, a plant-based meat substitute, and uh, he um, has big plans for expansions in uh, China which is uh, increasing its, uh, its uh, footprint. And so the question is, uh, what do you see as uh, long-term projected impacts of this kind of technology, and is uh, this discussed in the report? And then, yes. 
Yes. Um, I'd like to ask, uh, bring up a specific issue about biofuels. Uh, I'm very troubled that there's so much talk about biofuels being one of the principal solution sets. And I think we have to realize that in terms of the industrial scale that's being proposed by like the aviation industry, it, it's totally unrealistic and very damaging. So I think we have to really address, like what Jeanine mentioned, uh, run of the river, low, uh, low head hydro. There are a lot of ways of producing energy, but I think they're more focused on energy in the place where that energy is being formed by the natural systems and not get into this uh, siren song that the aviation industry will be carbon free through the use of purposely grown biofuels. And it's gonna be a huge impact on food security and it really is not necessary I'd say something here, heretical. I'd say, let the aviation industry have a prioritized allocation to petroleum, because it's a very difficult way to make that kind of kerosene. And they can only buy it if they buy thousands and thousands of trees for carbon offsetting. But I think if we go the route of massive biofuels plantations, it's going to be very detrimental to the world. Thanks, and uh, I'll take one more question right here. And then we'll do this. And then um, thank you so much. Everybody was incredible on this panel. Um, I, this is to Cynthia. I, I don't know how she smiles talking about the data that she's sharing with us. Um, anyway, here in New York City, um, there seems to, at least in lower Manhattan, um, there is frustration because, you know, the latest report for the city data um, for citywide greenhouse gases with the baseline at 2005, the latest that's available is 2017. It's really plateaued since 2012. So it's only a decrease of 17%. And how are you going to get there, the remaining 23%, uh, you know, the 80 by 50? All these people make these great statements, but we're not actually getting there. And that midpoint was 40 by 2030. And so we need to cut off the next nugget of 23% in a dozen years. And so, you know, how can we get there as quickly as possible? Thank you. Great, thanks. Some of those questions were directed at specific people, but then I invite everyone um, on the panel to, to respond to whatever you would like. Um, maybe we can start with Janine. So two to three real collaborations. Um, I would again, a pitch for the right energy partnership. We're always looking for um, partners in that. Um, but we're also developing a set of gold standards through the Global Landscape Forum, which is having an event tomorrow at the UN headquarters. Uh, but beyond that, um, you know, those tangible ongoing things, um, I really think that uh, it would be helpful if everyone read the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and incorporated into your work the concept of free prior and informed consent. Because I strongly, I'm coming to this point where I realize that we've been we've been fighting for this for our, for our people for so long, and it's it's mostly a language barrier um, that gets people um, kind of uh, like confused, but also defensive when indigenous peoples are fighting for free, prior, and informed consent. But when I say indigenous peoples' rights are human rights, I do mean that. And everyone deserves free, prior, and informed consent when it comes to the development um, of, of large-scale industries, or, or small or large, that affect your community, that affect your home, that affect your family. And we need to get used to demanding that. You know, the same policies and processes that these projects are, are put into, whether they're renewable or not, whether when our countries are making these goals and these statements without consulting their civil society and their communities, this is where you're gonna see these plateaus. Like, we should all demand the seat at the table and a part, being part of the solution and demand that our consent be, be granted or be given in order to give the go-ahead for these things. The other is in, in a lot of work, and I just got back from DC last night, um, where we met with congressional staff because one of our simple asks across the board is to integrate con comprehensive policy that recognizes the traditional ecological knowledge and traditional ecological practices of, of indigenous peoples because a lot of our solutions going forward are going to be rooted in those systems. And I bring that up because, you know, at the UN, they have all of these great mapping, mapping projects and all of these great 
solutions for where's the best place to pit renewable energy, where's the most fertile lands that we need to grow our, our, our large-scale agriculture to feed the world. And it's, it's so divorced from the reality that, one, we have, we're wasting so much food already that there are social economic barriers to food security that need to be addressed first and that are probably much more feasible to address more quickly. Um, but also, the, those aren't the only places we grow food. Those aren't the only places to get food. Like indigenous peoples are in our, in, in our landscapes and our relationships to our landscapes, we know that the food is integrated throughout the ecosystem. Everything from insects, everything from how you take care of the wild medicines and the wild plants that are within your, within your ecosystem. These are all important tidbits of knowledge that need to be brought because with this current model that we have, when there is a recognition of traditional ecological practices and the production of a superfood like quinoa, and that gets accepted and adopted, what happens? Commercialize large-scale production of the superfood, a watering down of the quality, a watering down of the seed, a, a genetic modification of the seed. And we're losing the memory of our plants. Our pl we're forcing this genocide of our foods because we're not looking at the whole integrated system. So that's another thing. And then connect with indigenous experts. I know someone mentioned earlier today we're high, highly connected, but we're also very isolated still. Um, there's an indigenous expert for almost any field you can think of. There are books that have been written just pleading to be read that can offer these solutions and offer these alternative viewpoints. And I, like, I strongly encourage, use Google. It's your friend sometimes. <laughs> To some of them, some of the questions. Thank you very much for them or for me. First, plant-based food. So the report does include them, um, and uh, basically what the authors came together to say is there are promising technologies. They are emerging. And a lot more work needs to be done. This is not only the plant-based, but the cellular, cultured, and also we do include insects as well. So those things are covered. And uh, so uh, emerging, um, we need to keep working on them and also be sure, whenever, whatever solutions that um, are part of the portfolio, because it's never just one thing, um, we just also always have to make sure uh, that the car what their carbon footprint is, and also then be, be aware that under changing climate conditions, there will be effects on, on them as well. So all those things have to be taken into account, but def they are definitely in. Um, the next one was on biofuels um, um, at industrial scales. So um, here, basically with the 1.5 degree C report, there is finally a very simple target, right? Zero emissions by 2050. So how are we gonna get there? And this is a little bit Catherine's question as well. But clearly there needs to be, so a lot of that has to be fossil fuel related, right? Uh, everything electrified, renewables, everything, right? But remember what I said about a third of the emissions are from food. So clearly land-based and the contribution of the food system really needs to be part of it. Land can't do it all. This is one of the kind of uh, memes, I guess you would say, of the report. Uh, land is part of the solution, but land can't do it all. Um, the report is very cl clear that it's possible, but with tremendous care for sustainability. But this is where the food system approach becomes so important because actually to actually have a free upland, it's called, you know, the land sparing uh, approach, Di change in diets is required. And also, Janine mentioned food loss and waste. And we talk a lot in the report also about food loss and waste. So turning to New York City, um, because uh, we also we also do a lot of work here, right where our home is. So that's like our you know we're based here, um, and I think what we need to think about is um, all the things that the city is doing in Plan YC that was released on uh, in April, right? And those are all the technical solutions. 
But I think given the perspective from the land report, tying that to Plan YC and sort of a focus on urban areas that there's a lot of, lot of, uh, a lot of energy around. Cities are gonna really help to solve, uh, solve a lot of these things, uh, a lot of these issues. But I think we should think about diets and food loss and waste right here in New York. And I think that would be really energizing, new, and you know, let's start a down downtown everywhere campaign, but you know, I know you work downtown, Catherine. Um, local and regional campaign to, all right, let's get serious about the food system emissions right here in New York. That, would, that could be leadership because what, because of Remember, a lot of, you know, the demand is not where it's grown, so, and that could be something that we could partner and collaborate on. Yeah, I, I was going to say, you know, New York serves, what, a million, uh, um, New York City schools serves a million uh, meals a day, right? So if you wanted to choose a place where you could intervene, Right, the, the meals in city, uh, city schools would be good. NRDC is already working on, on getting uh, um, a compostable, reusable uh, dishware uh, so that you're not creating additional waste in addition to the, the food waste. But, but inter intervening at, at the schools gives you a local specific place. Uh, one, what, another hat I wear is I'm uh, 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 global chairman of Earth Day. So I invite you all to celebrate the 50th anniversary uh, next spring uh, with us with a massive global action. Uh, uh, and so one thing I've looked at when I, through the, doing that work, right, is that when you analyze voting patterns, right, the most loyal green voters historically have been Latinos, right? So if you want to do environmental work, register Latinos to vote. Right, you want to do something specific, register people to vote, right? It's, it doesn't sound like you're doing environmental work, but you're doing environmental work, right? You, you, you want more people to vote, or be registered to vote that are going to vote consistent with your values, which you're not permitted, I guess, supposed to ask that in advance. Well, but I can tell you the data il illustrates that, right? And as to food, right, I urge you all, to, uh, my, uh, the, one of the creators of Earth Day, Dennis Hayes, Right, uh, wrote a, he and his wife wrote a book last year called Cowed, and I urge everyone to read it. It did cause my daughter to exclaim after reading a few pages, oh my God, there's cow in everything. <laughs> uh, um, and it is kind of disturbing in that way. <laughs> yeah. I want to come back to the question of collaborations and briefly highlight a couple that come out of the um, case studies that I described in my presentation. So in terms of the lawsuit that I led in the Amazon region, which is kind of the children's trust uh, for the Amazon, although because of the constitutional uh, law uh, system fast track uh, procedure that we used, the decision from the Supreme Court of Colombia came down a lot faster than the Juliana case will be decided here. But uh, there was at the heart of that case, and there continues to be at the heart of, of that case, strong claim about the need for intergenerational collaboration, right? So bearing in mind the rights and the livelihoods and the planet that uh, young people and people and the armed born will be uh, having to live with. And, um, and that's, that's a hard one for both policymakers and for lawyers because the issues of standing, the issues of, of, uh, of how the international human rights framework has been drafted, all the language seems to point to the fact that all the protections are designed for existing living generations, living human beings. So it, that's pushing the boundaries in the same way and this is the, the second collaboration that I wanted to highlight coming back to the issue of EPIC, of free prior and informed consent. The, the other case study that I briefly described of the Belo Monte Dam um, in uh, the Brazilian Amazon is one such case of a failed opportunity to listen. And then this happened in 2012. It could have been stopped. And in only a matter of seven years, we already seen the impact, the disastrous impact in terms of 
deforestation. In terms of, as I said, and this is the sad irony of the case, of the <coughs> uselessness of the dam that was built because deforestation now affected the, uh, the, uh, the rain cycle. And there is no rain to feed the dam. So the dam is, for all practical purposes, useless. Billions and billions of dollars sunk into that infrastructure project. But it could have been saved if indigenous peoples and other socio-environmental activists in the region had been listened to. Back then, they were pushed out of the conversations. They were not consulted, not even consulted, let alone um, given the decision to say no. So at this point, this is where a lot of, I'm encouraged by that development, the coming together of indigenous people, say from the uh, Amazon region and the Standing Rock uh, uh, <coughs> struggle here, and science showing that in some places of the world, and, it, and to some extent, just saying no is part of the answer. Right? That's, that, that's one possibility that we need to consider seriously for the first time, say no. <coughs> Great, thank you. Um, and uh, because of the time, I'm sorry, we don't have any more time for questions because I promised Cynthia she could run back to, to uh, working on her report on, and we are at time already. But I do want to first say a huge thank you to my panelists here. We really, really appreciate uh, your taking the time to do it. I also would like to thank all of you for bearing with us um, all day. I know it's been a very long day. There's been a lot of science and law and things that, that can be really dense to talk about. So thank you for sticking with us to the end. Um, and also a huge thank you to all of the organizations that co-sponsored this and to our colleagues, colleagues who worked so hard to put this together. Um, a special shout out to my colleague Sam and particularly to my colleague Selena. Um, please. <laughs> Alina worked so hard putting together this conference that I told her she has to take next Friday off, and I hope you all encourage her to do so. Um, and thank you to Ford Foundation for making the room available and for sponsoring the conference as well. Um, and we are really looking forward, um, I'm speaking on behalf of the co-organizers now, but looking forward to continuing the conversation and importantly to focusing on the hard work that we all need to do, the types of things we're talking about on this panel to move forward collaboratively and to roll up our sleeves and to take action um, as, as soon as possible. I have to say, I find most of the conferences I go to on climate change so depressing that I do want to cry. I have two young children and it is heartbreaking. <laughs> But it's also really inspiring to see all of you now at ADOC. <laughs> and also, particularly to be able to sit next to Cynthia and still see a smile on her face gives me hope that we can all work together. Um, and as, um, yes, Bet as Betty Vasquez, a land defender in Honduras, once said, it is not an option, but rather an obligation to speak out, all of us together, to demand changes. And I truly believe this and really hope and challenge all of you to think about how you can take the lessons from today and apply them to your own lives and your own work and, and find ways to all work together as well. Thank you.